Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me is Dr. Stephanie Rossow, a veterinary diagnostician at the University of Minnesota and somebody that's been a thought leader in diagnostic uh, assays and submissions really for the swine industry for, for the entirety of my career. Uh, Dr. Rossow, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, look forward to hearing what you've got uh, to say today. But before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Give them a little background on yourself. Okay, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, to talk today. Um, I've been, um, uh, as I tell people of recent, that you know, I opened my first dead pig in 1978. Uh, and so I've been, spent most of my career here at the University of Minnesota in the veterinary, veterinary diagnostic lab, really focused on pig diseases, um, uh, whether they're infectious or, or production related. And, um, and so that's essentially all close to 30 years now I've been, uh, been working on pigs. So, um, I hope I can bring a little experience to, uh, uh, to my uh, opinions and um, and observations. Excellent. Well, I think that's a perfect introduction, um, Dr. Rossow, for our, our topic today. We're going to talk about um, a new PCR assay that you and your team uh, at Minnesota developed not that long ago, a PCR for coccidia. And um, it's certainly a pathogen that's been around since that first pig you would have posted in the late 1970s. Um, but a, a new assay, a new way to, to help producers and veterinarians in the field understand the coccidia burden on their farm. You want to talk a little bit about, um, for an old disease, why you built a new technology to help with the diagnostic efforts there? Sure. Uh, and coccidia is kind of interesting. It was, uh, you know, when I say coccidia, I'm referring to, uh, it used to be Isosporus suis and now is Cysto Isosporus suis. Uh, is a uh, more common accepted name now, and because there's a couple different coccidias in pigs, and but the ice, the cystoisosporosis is is the main primary pathogen that uh, that affects pigs, and it's kind of interesting. It was first identified back in the 50s, uh, and really not assigned any significance till about 1978, actually. Um, and so, uh, just kind of goes to show between when we find something and figure out how important it is, can some time can pass. But we've noticed, um, you know, coccidia, uh, as I'll refer to in, in pigs, primarily a farrowing house disease. We can see kind of a, some more recent burgeoning and immediate post weaning uh, pigs also, but uh, really an important disease of that young pig. Uh, and trying to prevent infection because you know, piglets that are just a few days old that get coccidia have a far worse outcome than than pigs that may pick it up um, later later in life. And historically, um, we've relied on histopathology uh, to do a lot of that early coccidia diagnosis, and histopathology works very well uh, for diagnosing coccidia. Um, it's just that you know over the years it's have noticed that you know we're probably seeing fewer piglets euthanized uh, and sent in specifically for diagnostics. People are making more of a use for anti-mortem uh, or or live piglet samples um, as well as post-mortem samples. And um, so one of the couple of things that we run across uh, with post post-mortem samples is that. The structure of the intestine, there's villi that stick out and project into the lumen. And when pigs die, though they start to decompose fairly quickly within 15 to 20 minutes of of death. And that's those tips of the villi are really where we see the coccidia on histopath. And so um, that kind of lessens the impact or value of, of histopath in those cases. And then it's really a segmental disease in the small intestine. And by segmental, I mean that, you know, it's not the same from the, where it, where it, uh, where the small intestine exits the stomach to where it enters the colon. It can occur to different degrees in different areas. And, and we look more commonly kind of at the middle to bottom of the small intestine. So 
uh, even if you have great samples and you just send in one section, you know, the odds are that you're probably not going to find it uh, in just one section of small intestine. Um, and so it seemed like there's probably a better way uh, to find coccidia, especially in these younger pigs. Uh, you can do fecal floats for coccidia oocysts, but they're not always, they're not going to be present in the really acute cases. And then even as pigs age and get older to where they're shedding, it's not always a consistent um, uh, shedding with the feces. And so uh, we wanted to, thought there was a way to better apply, um, do some better diagnostics for coccidia. And so uh, we looked at a PCR test um, that we can use concurrently with antemortem samples. And so swabs or fecal samples, even postmortem intestinal samples uh, coming in that um, we can use to test for you know, the rotaviruses, do cultures on, look for a PED, Delta Corona, and then add coccidia uh, into the mix on that. And uh, uh, initial results have been very promising. Uh, it looks uh, like we're, uh, when we Validated it and correlated it to um, the histopath from known cases with you know nice histopath lesions, good submissions. Uh, there's a real good correlate to to histopathology lesions, and so um, we're still kind of early days in in the big picture on it. But so far, I think it's been valuable and and really will be uh, a good uh, addition to the toolkit. We're looking at those farrowing house uh, diarrhea samples um, that come in. And one thing that's been a little interesting uh, that um, probably have underappreciated it maybe is these end of farrowing, early post-weaning villus atrophy cases where we didn't necessarily find lots of coccidion histopath, again, whether there's autolysis or um, lack of sections, but we get some pretty strong PCR results back for uh, for uh, for the uh, coccidia and um, so you know, coccidia is listed as kind of being kind of a biphasic event that pigs go through. So I don't you know could be a representation of that. Kind of the question that we get commonly is okay you know what does what's the CT value that's important on it. Um, and if you're not familiar with CT values, it's just a representation on the PCR test of strength of signal, which the lower the number, the stronger the, the stronger the result. It's a little uh, opposite of what you might think. But when then looking at tissues with, you know, multiple sections where we get nice villus atrophy, you can see lots of coccidia uh, in them. We'll get CT values in the 18 to 23 range, so not untypical for what we see for other enteric diseases in pigs. Um, and, um, you know, I, it, you know, interpreting that it's, it's, it's not necessarily just a straightforward thing. Um, you know, we've got to consider the sample that you sent in and the age of the pig you sampled, you know, we'll get for lack of uh, a better sample that they can get. Sometimes we just kind of get a brown discolored swab in. And so when we're you know, doing cultures and a bunch of different rota PCRs and PED, and, and so sometimes the sample volume might not be there. So, you know, if we got a 32 CT and a five-day-old pig, I'd probably be more inclined to interpret that as significant because I would really don't want a five-day-old pig to be positive for coccidia, as opposed to, say, like a 23-day-old pig that has a 32 CT value, which is is probably, you know, just kind of a subclinical background infection, which could be informative, but uh, really different on, on interpretation. Do you need to adjust um, your kind of thresholds for CT interpretation based on the sample type? Would we expect stronger signals generally from tissue cases than from feces, or, or am I thinking that thinking too deep on that? And same CT kind of thresholds can be applied to any sample type for this PCR. So far, it's, it's, I think it's, you know, it's in, uh, from looking at the coccidia, it's very similar. Uh, and, and, and that holds true for things like rotavirus and other enteric diseases is that, you know, if you do a side-by-side -side with 
what we see on histopath and then just clinical samples from pigs, they have a similar range. Consideration on, on um, like most any diagnostic test, you know, even with PCRs and really sensitive tests, to me still, you know, like 90, 95% of finding the right answer is getting the right pig at the right time. Uh, and that's, you know, the whole, like I said, that's still the biggest thing on, on diagnostics for most anything is still, you know, and, and it's a skill set that some people excel at, and it's a skill set that other people don't necessarily excel at. So, uh, you know, if you've got someone on the farm, that's really good at, you know, picking up, uh, you know, what, who the right pig is, uh, at the right time to sample, that's, that's by and far still the most important, um, part of, of getting the right answer for, for the tests. And so kind of hoping that maybe, you know, you see those bearing crates that have the gray, yellow fecal material smeared along the edge of the crate. Uh, it's kind of, you know, oh, you know, maybe we've got some coccidia. So hopefully it's maybe just some fecal material from the crate as a pooled sample and, and, uh, and get an answer back and, and then go from there. I really appreciate uh, not only the development of, of that assay, but also you coming on and chatting with us about it, Dr. Rossell. l Biotics, the pioneer postbiotic for digestive health in pigs. Brought to you by Adair Biome. With over a century of experience in postbiotics for digestive health, l Biotics contains heat-treated lactobacillus cell bodies and their metabolites. Stable by nature, l Biotics can be easily stored and incorporated in compound feed. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. And to our audience, thank you for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please check us out at swinehealthblackbelt.com. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on the next episode. For Dr. Stephanie Rossow, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for being a part of the podcast with us this week. Appreciate you joining and please have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.